Hello Sue and hello Paul, good for you to join us today. So Sue, you wrote a fascinating piece focusing on family policy uh, for Relocate Global recently and in you had in mind the uh, Great Education um, International Schools Fair. So mm -hmm. can you just give us a bit of the background behind that and why you think family issues are so important at this time? Well, in fact, I think um, family issues have really come to the fore, haven't they, in the sort of um, COVID-19 pandemic era, uh, because obviously, although we're st seeing a rise in sort of unaccompanied mobility, short term assignments, commuter assignments and so on, um, in place of perhaps the long term assignments, which tend to be accompanied, uh, we're actually seeing also um, a move towards virtual assignments as well. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can ignore the family issues for education, because you've still got people who are moving um, on you know, assignments where they're taking families with them and of course you've also got people who are kind of stranded in countries where they haven't been able to move back or they're in a third country for example or indeed they've come back sooner than planned they've been repatriated sooner than planned so clearly what you've got there is educational issues that come to the fore so families have still got to find suitable schools for their children if they are relocating abroad on a long-term assignment or indeed even if it's a longer short-term assignment and they're taking family members with them um, but of course, they can't do it in the same way as they used to. So uh, in the past, obviously, families would accompany the employee on the pre-assignment trip and they would be combining sort of school search and home search and so on on that trip. And those trips are less likely to be taking place now. They're more likely to occur virtually. Um, so, of course, the schools are, have actually uh, stepped into the breach quite well. And there's a lot of virtual support happening now in terms of um, previewing schools, tours of schools, uh, virtual open days, those kind of things that families can um, can make use of. Um, but similarly, go, going to the other side of it, the, you know, the, the, the repatriation earlier than planned or being stuck in a country where you hadn't actually planned to be, um, the same issues are going to apply because if families are with you, you've got to actually ensure that schooling is available for children and those children can be repatriated successfully or incorporated in a third country school system. So, so once again, that becomes um, an incredibly important issue for families uh, and for schools to um, support them. And just to say, really, there's uh, obviously, a lot of support available from consultancies in that school search area. Um, there's niche consultancies that can help, um, particularly, for example, with special needs um, children and so on. Uh, so it's an area that global mobility professionals really can't ignore. Um, so I think that's why it's a crucial issue. Um, it's always been important, hasn't it? Families won't move or can't repatriate or can't stay in a particular location unless they're unless their children are catered for and that just simply hasn't gone away there's just increased pressure now to to get it right and to secure the correct um schooling and also you know align with that the sort of health and well-being issues that are important for families too yeah so may i bring in now paul williamson who's um a uh, well-respected uh learning and development professional and who's worked with us and done some great uh, presentations at the Festival of Global People, for example. So, Paul, I mean, what are you picking up from the people that you're working with and how families are coping with the new circumstances and having to work from home, for example? Well, I think um, with the proliferation of kind of home working, uh, and that's been forced on a lot of people, hasn't it? Um, I think it's created a, an extraordinary amount of pressure on on on, on parents working from home um, to support their children within that environment, um, and I think it's kind of exacerbated a, um, a a lot of you know it kind of magnifies issues I suppose, um, and there's there's all sorts of uh, issues that could come up for for children and for adults in terms of um, feeling connected with other human beings. Um, it's much tougher when you're uh, in your own home and um, disconnected, I suppose. Um, so certainly, I think, uh, you know, what Sue was saying about health and well-being, it's, it's really important to have a to have a focus on this. And I think that's where uh, organisations need to um, bear in mind the circumstances of, of their employees, because um, people's circumstances can um, can vary wildly, I suppose. 
Um, and therefore, you know, adaptations that you can make uh, around workplace and pressure is really important. Um, but I think certainly from somebody who's working from home as well, um, it can be that kind of difficult blending of time, I suppose, you know, when are you at work and when you are not at work. Uh, and I think that affects sometimes how you show up as a parent as well. Because sometimes your time, although you think it would be, um, you know, more available to you when you're working from home, sometimes it's not. And sometimes you aren't being as attentive to your kids as you should be. So I, th I think it raises, a, you know, a number of issues. Uh, and one that um, uh, I think we all need to attend to, certainly things like resilience. How do we keep ourselves feeling positive and focused? How do we provide... Um, the right kind of support uh, for our colleagues, friends, and family. Um, it's a complicated issue, and, it one, and it's one that requires us to take a step back and to take a pause from time to time to kind of consider this uh, more fully. Can I jump in there? Because I just say that work-life balance thing is a real, really important issue. And certainly I've got colleagues that are trying to do homeschooling and they're trying to work at the same time. And it's almost impossible to sort of juggle and balance. And, the, and then you end up with these feelings of guilt um, that you're not actually doing either role um, professionally or properly. Um, so I think that's an area that employers actually do have to show a, a fair degree of flexibility on. Uh, and going back to your, your early points about the sort of medical issues, I think what we've seen with the pandemic is whereas uh, employees might have been selected for an assignment and gone abroad um, and medical issues, are, I won't say they're just a tick box exercise, but, you know, they haven't um, assumed the same degree of, uh, of importance, I guess. Um, now people with underlying health issues it's really come to the fore that that's actually recognised and that, um, you know, procedures are put in place to take care of people who otherwise would have been perfectly fit and healthy and fine, um, but now are increased risk. Uh, from the um, from the pandemic. So that kind of brings into the fore for families, the notion of sort of medical care, um, emergency evacuations. Uh, it's not just about having kind of insurance cover, if you can get insurance cover for COVID, uh, I suppose that raises an issue. But it's not just about the insurance cover, it's actually access to the facilities and being able to get um, the employees, the accompanying spouses and children um, to get them the care when they need it or to get them out. Um, you know, the emergency evacuation, if that's required. So, yeah, they're all intertwined issues, aren't they? Um, and they're all very important indeed. And how much of this should be highlighted in a relocation or global mobility policy then, do you think? I think um, global mobility policies are under review now, aren't they? And I mean, I think there's a big issue that in the past we've always said, well, you've got to stick to the policy. You can't undermine the policy and so on, because it just becomes a, a cost ratcheting up exercise if you start doing that. But I think today we're actually saying, well, OK, we've got to step back from the policy a little bit. We've got to think about flexibility within that and how we can actually use the policy more as a framework rather than as some sort of prescription that you cannot um diverge away from. Um, and I think global mobility professionals are probably rethinking policy content, um, moving towards a more flexible approach, probably within a framework of cost guidelines, because you can't just, you know, spend and spend and spend and spend, particularly when you've got issues today with businesses uh, perhaps not doing quite so well financially in, in the current economic climate. So you've got to have a mindful approach to cost, but at the same time, you've got to have a flexible approach to dealing with individual needs. And that's going to apply for families, um, you know, employees and the family as well, for all, all members of the family. Uh, I'd also just draw a, a point, though, that because we've got um, a, a move towards more virtual working, um, potentially employees going on their own and leaving families behind, we're obviously going to be seeing more of that because of the duty of care to the family. And you might not necessarily want to move entire families into areas that are less safe and secure than their home country um, you do need to take into account that family that family split you know where you're sort of away from your family is is very stressful it's very lonely uh, it's not good for relationships between 
you know, partners or between um, parents and their children. So again, that's an area that has to be thought through as to how you're going to manage it, because you can't just fly people backwards and forwards to, to for family reunions when you're in and out of, you know, ever changing quarantine rules and COVID spiking and then falling and spiking and falling. And it's just incredibly difficult. So it's an area that I think is going to require huge amounts of flexibility from companies uh, and their global mobility professionals have got this opportunity to be really quite strategic and help, you know, determining what policies are appropriate, how you apply them in a flexible and compassionate but cost effective manner. So, so yeah, there's a whole raft of issues there to, to consider. And what about um, elderly and other dependent relatives? Are you noticing that's cropping up more? Uh, it's an area of great concern because, I mean, obviously um, in the past, you know, pre-COVID, um, families would go abroad or individuals would go abroad and there would usually be some sort of provision to use home leave, for example, to come back and visit elder, elderly parents. Um, you'd have access to see them and so on. But of course, now it's more difficult in the sense that that access to visit them may not be there. You might be having to make decisions that they just can't live on their own at home anymore uh, in the community that they perhaps do have to go into care and trying to sort that out when you're abroad becomes increasingly difficult. Um, so I think, you know, employers that were very um, conscious of family issues in the past would certainly be flexible in allowing people to use the home leave or to be able to travel more frequently, to be able to visit elderly relatives and to manage care issues. Um, but that's becoming increasingly difficult because of restrictions on travel, um, restrictions on access to see elderly people, you know, whether you've got um, restrictions on how many people you can see and what level of COVID in, uh, is there and whether it's therefore possible to see them. All these things are actually going to require a more sort of, if you like, creative and flexible approach as to how people are actually able to manage elder care going forward. Mm. And Paul, what sort of um, support can be given uh, to people within organisations to help alleviate some of these stress points? Well, um, I think it's really important to, to, to try and address this because, uh, you know, we, we all know the, the impact that stress can have on the individual, but also on departments and, you know, organizations as a whole um, so actually when we become stressed we can lose up to 10 to 15 IQ points so this is when you know people start to make mistakes um, uh, so it can have a, a, a real impact on the bottom line and I think sometimes that that kind of gets lost in the discussion of this um, so it, it is important for particularly for leaders to, to really think about this. Um, it's not so soft and fluffy. It's really necessary to, to start looking at ways in which you can support um, communities. And I use that word, um, you know, with intent, because I think uh, what you can create is communities of support. Um, and particularly, you know, I've seen that within your, um, you know, global relocation community, um you know you are able to reach people um uh and i think people in similar situations um can you know share how they're getting on so i think it doesn't have to be really complicated but i think it is using some of the technology we're using really well for things like virtual meetings you can also use if it's set up well and you contract well about you know keeping making a safe space for people to talk you can actually alleviate a lot of this pressure by allowing people the opportunity to talk about some of the things that they're worried about. And certainly I've run those within my own organization. Uh, and it's incredible, you know, people talk about how they're feeling in the moment. Um, and because everyone's got their video cameras are on, you can see one person kind of saying how they've been feeling and you can see everybody nodding. Yeah, And suddenly that connection is being grown within that community and people suddenly realise, oh, well, I thought I was alone or I thought I was the only one that felt like that. Um, and by sharing these stories, we're connecting with one another in a human way. And I think that's what's really necessary at this uh, present moment in time. We need to connect. We need to connect as human beings and we need to, and, that, and businesses need to reflect that need, I guess, um, not just in their policies and procedures, but more importantly, in their behaviours. 
uh, and what they're actually doing and saying and, and enacting in the workplace uh, is really important to bring this kind of thing to life, provide the right support, um, because, you know, that creates an engaged workforce, that in creates that creates people who, who then want to give back to their organisations because they can tell that their organisations care about them. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And then just a, an, another point that came out in our family focus um, network um, webinar we had in the summer was that actually a lot of the destination service providers were being very proactive about bringing their international assignment communities together and describing the sorts of initiatives you were talking about and that so that they didn't feel alone um, and were meeting and connecting with other people. So just to round up then, perhaps we could just have a few top tips of uh, what you think people can do about engaging and supporting families uh, during this time. Sue, from, from your perspective. Um, I think it's this point about communication that Paul has raised, actually, because, you know, people, it's always been traditional, hasn't it, that you go on an assignment and you're out of sight, out of mind. Even if somebody is on, um, you know, split up from their family, you've got the family at home and the assignee abroad, you know, the, facilitating communication between the assignee and the company and between the family and the assignee and the family and the global mobility professional, you know, that sort of triangle, uh, actually linking people up together, I think is, is very important. Um, in terms of uh, your stress and, and, and that aspect that Paul talked about, it's also the fact that stress is about inability to cope or feelings of inability to cope and often you feel unable to cope because you think you're the only one but actually you're not everybody's probably the same or in the same feeling the same thing so having those networks those communities of of practice if you like the ability to share your feelings in a safe space um, and continuing also with the things like employee assistance programs that you would probably have anyway but ensuring that those are actively being used in that sort of international environment i think is really important indeed um so i think my top tip is going to be keep that communications going thank you now paul what about your perspective on this well i'd, I'd echo those points i think um certainly reaching out i mean um you know it's it's got quite desperate for some people um certainly out in the you know those that have been um, made redundant and stuff like that within within this time frame for example um and so it's really important i think um to reach out to people um that you might be worried about um so i mean there's great advice from the samaritans you know and it's just the fact that actually just by reaching out and sending a, a, even a text message to somebody can be enough <laughs> so sometimes you know we overthink these things and we make them into much bigger things but actually just following your instincts sometimes and reaching out to somebody at, at the right time can make all the difference um so i think creating those communities um i think it's also encouraging people to access their healthy self so that's when we're feeling much calmer and resilient, when we can become more creative and we come, when we feel more resourceful. So anything that we can do to encourage people to take some time, um, particularly when you're working from home and perhaps there's a relentless feeling of just working from one thing to another and then our work hours may extend, it's actually taking the time just to take a break. Um, to go for a walk, to look out the window, to have a cup of tea, whatever whatever it is, I think those kinds of things are really important. Uh, and also to engage in things that will uh, make us feel positive. So whether that's listening to music or whether that's, you know, whatever it is for you that gives you some uh, emotional energy, um, you know, invest in that stuff and invest in learning. Because I think this is a great time as well to learn new things. Uh, to challenge ourselves and push us out outside of our comfort zone, um, but gather new skills, gather new competencies that are going to serve us well for the future. And there's a certain kind of letting go, I feel, at the moment, uh, where we have to let go of the, um, you know, our preferred ways of working, really. But it's finding creative solutions, creative angles. And we're, the way we can do that is to, um, is to kind of calm ourselves down and give us a, 
give ourselves the time and opportunity to come up with some of those solutions. Um, and you, you can't do that when you're stressed and you can't do that when you're overwhelmed. So it, it's recognizing that in yourself, really. Thank you very much. Can, yeah. I just, can I just comment on that and that notion of spillover as well between um, your work life and your home life? Because I think it's um, it's all very well working at home, but the issue is, is then you just keep on working, don't you? You don't really take that break. Um, and certainly people who, you know, live and work abroad, expatriates, they're well known for having a very poor work-life balance. Um, they're very well known for just having to sort of lead by their presence and by example, and they, they don't on the whole take all their annual leave and all these sorts of things. And quite often that sort of is a, a reflection of the fact that they're not necessarily as culturally competent as they might be, and they don't really trust local people to get on and do things that they could possibly delegate to them. So they end up doing trying to do everything themselves. And of course, that can end up in a worse situation if you're trying to work virtually, because you've you've got no real break between or no real division between your home life and your and your work life. So you've got this great spillover between uh, work and home. Um, and also you're trying to lead, but you're trying to do that leadership role. You're trying to do it virtually as well, which was going to make it quite stressful, I think, for individuals. So I want to just pick up on the point about um, encouraging people to undertake training if there's training available and to make time for it. Because I think that when you're working virtually, it actually becomes even more difficult because you don't pick up all the cultural cues that you see from body language when you're face to face. I mean, you do see a fair amount, but you don't see all of it in the same way. Uh, and particularly if your connectivity isn't great and you've got time delays on conversations, um, you haven't got a video link because the line won't support it, all those kinds of things are going to make working with local people much more tricky. Um, so I do think from the perspective of um, you know, ensuring that people are more competent, more capable, less stress, training is actually still incredibly important and still should be pursued uh, even if we're in uh, even if we're in this kind of remote work environment. Just just a final comment really on that. Yeah. And of course you have thankfully uh, made us um, a lovely selection of uh, family friendly fact sheets, but also the cultural ones as well. And just uh -huh. remind people that there's a huge amount of uh, cultural and cultural awareness support out there from platforms to individual um, sessions. But also um, one of your favourite um, solutions, Paul, is obviously coaching, um, which can prove to be hugely supportive to people on an international assignment and indeed their partners. So thank you very much. That's great to talk to you today about the family issues. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.